Life can get crazy at times. But Audible, inhale, exhale, is your escape. Find the right title for any moment, like our exclusive meditation and sleep collection, and discover new originals, audiobooks, and podcasts with our new Plus catalog. New subscribers can sign up for a free 30-day trial at audible.com. Imprisoned for 10,000 years, banished from my own homeland, and now you dare enter my realm. <laughs> Prepare for Outland. Create your Blood Elf or Draenei character today. World of Warcraft Burning Crusade Classic. Available now for PC and Mac. Learn more at WoWClassic.com. This episode is brought to you in iHeart 3D Audio. For maximum effect, headphones are recommended. iHeart 3D Audio. Charges is created by Portal A and Control Media. It's produced by DB Podcasts in association with iHeartRadio. This time, a former Suns player who you might remember as T-Rex. More video in just a moment, but this is Rex Chapman's mugshot, and we are learning a lot more about the charges. Now the Cubs hit you, and you're, uh, you're in fight-or-flight mode, and you're definitely fighting. I'm like, please, like, this is five minutes. This is five minutes on the scores table, man. You were over and removing yourself from the situation. Trying my best. You're not backing away from a fight. Ben is not backing away from a fight. Ben's not going to back away from a fight. I'm like, bro, what the hell, man? The guy throwing stuff at me. Welcome to Charges. I'm your host, Rex Chapman. My guest today is Meta Sandiford Artest, a.k.a. Meta World Peace. He's an NBA champ mental health advocate, and someone I'm proud to consider my friend. Hailing from Queensbridge, New York, his storied career has been checkered with roadblocks and missteps, but he's overcome those things and has inspired millions of others along his path. Today, we'll discuss in his words the infamous malice at the palace, the circumstances leading up to it, as well as the consequences and the aftermath. This is a fantastic interview, and I hope you all will enjoy this episode of Chargers with Rex Chapman. Thanks for joining me, Meta. I really appreciate this, bro. Uh, absolutely, man. It's really cool being here. I remember um, when you uh, first started on Twitter, and I was just like scrolling through Twitter, and I was just like, wow, this is pretty funny. And then the next day, I'm like, this is really funny. So that I just started following you. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. This is like world star hip hop. Like, you're just a world star hip hop. <laughs> By yourself. You know what's funny about that, man, is that the very first time somebody, this was a couple years ago, and somebody, I was around uh, uh, the Phoenix Suns, and, you know, most of the guys in the locker room were black. And uh, somebody said, man, have you followed Rex's Twitter? And uh, they were like, no, why? Why is it any good? They said, no, it, it, it's great. He said, it's it's world star for white people. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> and I'm sure you you probably follow World Star maybe also. Oh yeah, for sure, okay. for sure. No, it's like really cool, man. I was just like, I mean, it's just like you never, I've never seen this from a basketball player, you know, that is that entertaining. I mean, we got Shaq. Shaq is really funny, but he has like a big platform. But I'm talking about everyday pure comedy. Like I'm like, where do you get your videos from? I wanted to ask you. <laughs> Like, man. where do you get your videos from? I thought you had this big media company. You get all the best nah, videos. Oh man. <laughs> so many people send me stuff now. I wake up and it was kind of hard finding them at first, you know, people sharing stuff. And then uh, people just start sending them. I'm like, man, this is great. And so, you know, nothing better than putting a couple smiles on people's faces throughout the day. You know, pick my spots to be serious, you know. Right, right. right. I, did, right. I did see a couple of nice ones where, you know, you were uh, kind of getting after, not after, but Maybe add a little politics in there sometimes. That's right. That's but, right. Pick my yeah. spots. Right. Uh-huh. Really cool. All right, Meta. Tell me about growing up in Queensbridge. Well, you know, um, yeah, growing up in Queensbridge is really interesting because, you know, you got uh, MC Shan from Queensbridge, Molly Ma, who produced records for KRS-One, Big Daddy Kane, um, and the list goes on. 
right? And then comes along uh, Nasty Nas from our neighborhood, Capone, Noriega, Mark Deep, Roxanne Shante, and all these, uh, you know, and just all a list of amazing artists. Then you have people like Hank Carter, who's from our area, who just recently had a hospital uh, wing named after him in Uptown. Uh, you probably played in the wheelchair classic before. Maybe you played in the wheelchair classics. <laughs> I did. Probably did, right? Yep. Yeah. That's Hank Carter. Hank Carter's from Queensbridge Projects, and that program was, you know, started to help paraplegics. Uh, but, you know, another big success story, then you have Vern Fleming. I played against Vern. Absolutely. So me and Vern Fleming are like distant relatives because his niece has a baby with my cousin, with my first cousin. They have a baby together. Vern's got that real high voice. He would yeah, call he out play two, two. <laughs> <laughs> Big point guard, too. Yeah, 6'5", could do guard. everything. Vern was tough, man, real tough. I mean, he's the Olympian, uh, yeah. gold medalist, and he's right from my same block. I mean, this block's where I seen Capone from Noriega in the street shoot at people. Wow. <laughs> you know, block's where I seen um, one gentleman died from being choked by a police officer. We from that block. You know, Vern is from the trenches. And then you got Sean Green. Sean Green played for the Indiana Pacers. He's from Nas Block. It was a guy that I played with back home, back in the hood. His name is Terminator. And Terminator used to drink uh, Old E at the Rucker Park. <laughs> oh, my God. During the game. That was and his game. Buckets. So, oh, 40. <laughs> 40. Oh, that's great. 40. I seen him get 40 off the glass, off the glass, teardrop off the glass. Just nice. Terminator, and he's about 38, 40 years old. Damn, nice. just getting it Should've done. Should have been in the Doing. NBA, but he was like unbelievable talent. Wow. This is like, wow. An, this is all one hood. So what, you know? what was it like for you as a kid, though, navigating that world? Because you see some success mixed in there, and you see a lot of people that are struggling. How do you negotiate that as a kid growing up there? Man, you just like, I mean, I had my fair share opportunities where I would dibble and dabble, and then... I said, okay, I'm not going to get involved, but I always got back involved in something. But I always got lucky. I always somehow avoided fully getting involved. And it's mostly like either you're going to deal drugs, maybe go down, smoke a lot of weed, and then really hurt your athleticism and different things. That can hurt you. Violent stuff, getting involved, robberies and different things. So it's like you always have a decision to make because most of your friends are like, somebody want to go to the store. Somebody might want to rob somebody, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, which friend do you go with today? <laughs> you know, um, so that Man. was pretty much a, the bulk of it. You know, you talked about, and you've been very open. And when I say that, I, I try to be with my past. You know, I've had my struggles, as you know, uh, because I know it can help people. And the more vulnerable you are. So I appreciate you talking about this stuff. And I know some of it is, is difficult. You know, you talked about being in anger management as a kid. You know, why were you placed in anger management? You know, what were some of those things that you were doing that, you know, caused that action to happen. So I have a history of mental health uh, issues in the family. And a lot of it has to do with not chemical. It starts out with depression and anxiety. And the body, if you become stressed, that could kill you. Stress triggers not only health problems. Stress will let you know if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and it exposes it. So when you pile on top of each other, that could turn into other chemical reactions also. So I don't know where it stemmed from, but, you know, my dad definitely had some issues. My auntie, who just passed away from COVID, she was in a psychiatric ward for 30 I'm sorry. years. I'm so sorry. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so a lot. Sorry. Thanks a lot. She was in the hospital for 30 years. Psychiatric ward, you know, and then we had different things. So with that being said, I was a kid where... Even if I was a normal kid, because most people in my neighborhood know me for being nice, very polite, you know, to the females and to the people. Um, but I had different things that I've experienced, you know. So sometimes it, you'll see it come out. Like a couple times I had a fight in the hood where it just like I got tired of something. I just start punching and, and fighting, right? Because it's exploding. And then too many times that happened. So is that chemical imbalance or is that experiencing a little too many things? You know what I'm saying? Would it happen at school ever? Or would it manifest itself on the playground? Or, I have or, fights in school. Yeah. I, have, I got suspended in um, preschool. First time I got suspended, I was like four. 
<laughs> yeah. And then um, kindergarten. I got suspended every year in school. And then when I got to LaSalle Academy, which is a Catholic school, I got suspended my first year there, um, 13 games. And then I didn't get suspended anymore. I got to St. John's, got in some trouble a little bit, destroyed Mike Jarvis' office. <laughs> Mike Jarvis and I go way back. You know, he coached Ramil Robinson and Patrick, oh, wow. of course, and Patrick and I go way back. But Mike coached Ramil Robinson in high school. I didn't and know then, that. then he went on, and Ramil and I were the same class, McDonald's game and all that stuff. And then he went on to coach at Boston U. And my freshman year at Kentucky, we played Boston U in, in our building. So I know Mike for a long time. He's a, he was a good man. Yeah, Mike is a great guy. His wife, you know, his wife is amazing. Yeah. I was sick one day and she cooked soup for me. She brought me chicken noodle <laughs> soup. I, I, I had the flu. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, amazing, though? I mean, you remember that. that That's what you remember to this day. That's good stuff, man. I mean, because that's she didn't have to do that. You were just a kid. You know, she didn't. And look, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, you can look back on. And when you're being recruited, you know, and, and he says, look, we're going to take care of him like he's family. He means it. He means it. And oh, that's he means a good, it. And that's a good man. Mm-hmm. You know, what? did you ever want to go? You, you end up at St. John's. Yeah. Um, did you want to go anywhere else? I almost was at Miami. That was just so what happened was I was committed to Miami University because I wanted to be an architect. So when I did my first five visits to Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Miami of Ohio, Notre Dame, Miami and St. John's. So I didn't want to go to Providence or Rhode Island or St. John's because they didn't have architecture. Notre Dame and Miami had architecture. So Miami of Ohio had Wally Zerbiak. Oh, yeah. And I was a big fan of Wally. Right, because he's from New York City. Yeah, that's right. And then, um, (laughs) so I took that visit. And then uh, Providence has Sham God Wells. I played with Sham God Wells. So I was like, man, I'm thinking about going here. Um, I think Sham went to the NBA after that, I think. And then, so St. John's is New York City, you know? So then when it was coming down to it, I was going to Miami. Then I made a last, literally the same day I was announcing on MSG that I was going to Miami. I decided to go to St. John's. I announced I'm going to wow. St. John's. I just stayed home. I was going to Miami. I just stayed home because I wanted to win a title, man. I wanted to win a title for St. John's. Felt like you had a little better chance there, right? Well, not a better chance. It was just fighting for the city. Yeah. You know, because yeah. me being from New York is a different experience than somebody else. Me, I wanted to win because I'm from New York. We proud. And St. John's has never won a title. And if I'm competitive, then I'm going to stay at St. John's. If I'm truly competitive, yeah, which I wanted to go to the Knicks also. <laughs> you wanted to be an architect? Yeah. Really? What prompted that? I mean, from what age? Well, when I was 13, I wanted to be a junior high school math teacher. And I knew like junior high school math teacher, they make 30, about 35 grand at that time. So I did that. I said, okay, I'll just be a junior high school math teacher, teach 13 year olds and then uh, help a 13 year old. Cause I remember at that age is when I was going through a lot. So I wanted to build community centers for my neighborhood. We had a community center called the Reese Jacob Center or Jacob Reese Center. And it was donated from some people overseas. And I remember wanting to build this and make it way better. So I said, I'll just be an architect and I could just build a community center. And that was the whole reason I I got into it. That was the whole reason I started taking math serious. But I was in between a lot of different things, education, basketball, streets, um, so many different things was in the way. You know, I didn't like really focus. Well, you know what I can tell you? I had some friends that wanted to be architects too. And neither one of them, both of them didn't end up becoming architects. And they went to school full time and didn't play basketball. Going to school for architecture and playing a sport, any sport at the same time is pretty damn tough. It was extremely difficult. Yeah, those courses are no joke. You know, I, I took the bunny courses. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, when I first did my first class, I saw I went to St. John's. St. John's didn't have architecture, but they had some classes that could lead to it. So when I started taking my first classes, I was doing it. But then the practices with Fran Fischilla was at 5.45 a.m., right? So <laughs> Fran. Franny, right? Franny, Franny. 5.45. I love Fran. And, and you got to be warm. Like, you got to be ready Better to be loose. go. Be loose. Be loose. Be loose at 5.45 a.m. I love Franny. I do too, man. He's (laughs) crazy. He pushed me to the limit. 
That's great. But uh, see, <laughs> that same way, you know, you watch college basketball. I know Jimmy Dykes, who does the games for uh, ESPN, he was my assistant coach in, uh, at Kentucky. He was assistant coach for Eddie Sutton. And I can hear his voice to this day, you know, in the car behind me because I didn't go to class and I'm having to run seven miles before practice and all that stuff. You know, they were hard on us, but man, we needed it. I needed yeah. it. I, you know, much the same, Ron. I, I quit my high school team. I was the best player in the state. Quit my high school team. Just like, I got mad at the coach. Got mad at the coach. <laughs> I would blow up. I got suspended in school. I got in fights in school. I would get too emotional. I would get too emotional to something that, and of course, you know, back then too, people didn't talk about mental illness. They didn't talk about depression. You know, looking back, I was for sure starting to suffer from depression when I got to college because I remember people looking at me being like, oh, he's got everything. People don't understand you don't just show up one day at the University of Kentucky or at St. John's. For you, all of a sudden, you just appeared for me. You're playing at St. John's. I'm like, that dude's good. But you appeared, and we don't put a lot of thought into it, and especially I think many of us in society, we just look at athletes as when they show up. And there's 18 years before all of that happened. And that's what I'm so appreciative that you're willing to talk about it. Let's jump to the NBA. You stayed a year at St. John's, right? Yeah. And your, if I'm not mistaken, your first year was 99, 2000. That was my last year. And I remember us coming to play, you guys. I want to say Elton, Elton Brand was maybe your yes. guys. He was the man. He averaged 20 points. Right, right. And I remember we played you, and I wasn't really playing a whole lot at that point. I wasn't very good. But I remember watching you and just being like, oh, my God, this dude is strong. And you could hold and grab more back then, too. Yeah. And you, and you could guard, you know, well, really everybody. Um, every you know, Every position. And you really didn't have much offense yet. You didn't have the confidence. You could do it. But I was like, man, once this dude – figures that part out, it's a wrap. So let me ask you, so you're 19 when you came in, right? Yeah. I was too. I was the youngest player my first year. Kareem was the oldest player. Wow. <laughs> How about that? He was 41. But so let me ask you, you come in at 19, when did you feel like you made it in the NBA? My third year at Chicago, I felt like I was ready because I was playing well. And I, I was like, okay, yeah, this is about to happen. I'm about to really, you know, basically work myself into my first contract. And I'm playing better. So it was way more encouraging. You know, I, I was averaging about 15 right before I got traded from the Bulls. And that's from, you know, the previous year, 11 and 12, and then went to 15. So I'm like, okay, keep working. And, that, you know, maybe next year I'll be 18. Maybe next year I'll be 20. And it just kept going up. So I was getting better and better. Yeah, it was a fast progression. Once you kind I mean – you know, half the battle is being able to compete physically. You know, yeah. if you can't compete physically, then it's really hard in this league. You could always do that. And then you had, I came in the other way. I was real light and thin for most of my career. And I had to learn to be more physical and to, right. you know, I was trying my whole life trying to go to the basket and not get fouled and lay it in <laughs> instead of do it, hit, getting hit and lay it in. So there was a lot. Well, because you started attacking more. You, you was attacking the rim. And how is that? Because I'm sure you got put down a couple times, oh, but man. you would fight back. So they, if somebody going to put you down, they risk Rex getting in their face and they risk getting punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. You know, I, I, I don't know where that came from. Probably from my dad because, you okay. know, he was, I never played good enough. I never played well enough. I remember coming home one day, Ron, I had like 47 points. <laughs> and he coached his own team. He coached a Division II team. So he didn't get to see me play very much. But it was my junior, senior year in high school. And I had like 47 and 15 and like 10 blocks. And, you know, we're not playing very good competition around here anyway. But I, I came home that night on the bus. And I was like, oh, man, he can't be upset about this. And I walked in, nothing. He didn't say anything. I walked behind him, asked my mom, is he okay? What's going on? She went, I don't know. I don't know. I walked back in there. He didn't say anything. Finally, I said, what'd you think? And he went, oh, you want to know what I think? I want to know when you're going to take a fucking charge. You ever going to take a charge? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See? Wow. So that was part of my stuff too. So I like, 
he was never physical. He big like us. I mean, he's big, but he was, uh, he had me perfectly wired to go to college. He played in the old ABA. So he, he had been around, but he had me perfectly wired to go to college and expect to not play. You know, I, I thought I was going to have to go in and I did, you know, I only weighed like 160 pounds. So I was going to have to go. In. He said, I hope they don't red shirt you. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I, I hope they don't either. But yeah, so we all have our stuff and our upbringing. And I think that really shapes us. So now you're playing well, you're um, in Chicago, but you're traded, you're traded to Indiana. Now for me personally, I remember you know, my whole life, everybody always just wanted me. They wanted me on their team. And so I've spent three and a half years in Charlotte. And then the Hornets traded me to Washington. And I remember kind of having my feelings hurt. I was kind of excited. But I was also, it, it hurt my pride a little bit. And I yeah, felt yeah. like, so tell me about for you, how did being traded for the first time, how did that affect you? Yeah, I mean, being traded, you know, it was tough because like, my favorite team growing up was the Chicago Bulls. You know, favorite team growing up was the Bulls. And then when you get traded and you work really hard on the court, you know, to make it to the NBA and you go to your favorite team, met Michael Jordan. I mean, that's just like, that's a dream come true. And then when you know it's over, it's like, and I, and I knew I would never go back and I left on bad terms. I was 21 when I got traded maybe turn 22, and pretty much our head case. I was a head case there, right? So I knew it was over. I got traded in Miami. I was on the bus. They told me you traded. They was like, okay. They said, don't shoot. Don't get dressed. Because, you know, when you get traded, team, yeah. they don't want you to shoot. They want you to just, you're done. Mm -hmm. And I didn't listen. I said, nah, I'm in Miami. I'm going to get my last couple shots. And I want So I put my game uniform on. And I just shot the whole time. I, went, I just had a nice little practice pregame session, went hard, and just really cherished the moment. Like, you know what? You messed it up, but, you know, just be grateful you was here with the Bulls. So I just went hard. I shot until they came back out at 40 minutes to go. No, how much? They got come out. You come out about with 20 minutes. So I just kept shooting. And then when the Bulls came back out, then I went in the back, and I was on my way to Indiana. And then I, when I went to Indiana, Vern Fleming was the coach. Oh, that's I forgot about that. He was the assistant coach. And I never met Vern when I was younger. And I always was upset about that because I'm like, you know, I heard so much about Vern Fleming. And, you know, Queens is a wild place, so. And he's got a twin brother. And he got a twin Vern and Vic. Yep, his, yep. They both was nice. <laughs> yeah. They both was nice. You know, but Queensbridge is just such a unique place where, you know, you grow up in a lot of friends. It's the biggest federal housing project in America, so. If you Vernon Fleming, you probably know a lot of people, so I can get why he didn't come back. So anyway, when I got to uh, Indiana and he passed me the ball, I'm just thinking about my idol. This is my idol. Like, this is the guy that I wanted to be. Like, this is the guy. And I know he had the gold medal. I thought I should have had a gold medal because when you're the defensive player of the year, and you don't get invited to the Olympics. I'm with you. <laughs> and you was an all-star. I'm with you. Right. So the first time I didn't get invited to the Olympics, I said, man, that's a shock. What year was that? 2004. All right. So let me ask this. So this was 2004. What year were you traded? I was traded in 2002. I was going through a lot. I was still led, okay. led the league in flagrant fouls, all that okay, stuff. Okay. So at this point, when you got passed over for it, do you feel like you were passed over because the powers that be thought you were a head case? Well, at that in 2004, I didn't know. Now, meanwhile, I was an Olympian in high school. I was on the USA team mm -hmm. in high school. So, you know, I'm primed to go to be a USA team in the NBA. So at that time, I didn't know nothing about the Olympics. I just thought you just go. So I said, oh, they passed me. Kobe's playing, a couple, my brother Kobe, a couple other people playing. So I didn't question it. But then... In 2008, when nobody picked my the phone call up, I called my agents. I was like scrambling. I'm like, yo, the Olympics is a month from now. And I don't even have, I'll take somebody's spot. Like, I knew they had LeBron. They had Mel Richard Jefferson. I said, listen, give me a tryout. I'm taking somebody's spot. This is going to be the easiest thing ever. Right? 
And literally, and my agent told me, he was like, listen, because of your history, people didn't want you to play on the team and they wasn't taking me. So I, I felt like that wasn't right because the Olympics and the NBA, don't, it's like it doesn't have anything to do with each other. As a player, I deserve to have a tryout. I'm saying, don't even pick me. Just let me go into practice and just snatch somebody's spot real easy. And then 2012 came. I was older, but I was like, man. But then right after that, then I had an, another incident in the NBA. I guess I didn't really deserve it. You know, I wasn't like the professional, but you know, but what I'm going to do, you know? But I really, I call myself an Olympian because there's no way that I'm not an Olympian, you know, but I just didn't make the team. Man. After all that planning, it's happening. Your DIY closet renovation is finally becoming a reality. Question is, where do you put your things while you work? CubeSmart has you covered with month-to-month -month leases and self-storage solutions that make it easier to get organized. Online or in person, getting self-storage is convenient and fast. And because DIY renovations can easily go over budget, it's great that CubeSmart is offering up to 25% off your monthly rent. Say goodbye to before and hello to after with CubeSmart self-storage. Visit CubeSmart.com for more details. We're making lower emission vehicles our priority. Reusable packaging, our priority. And carbon capture research to offset emissions, our priority. Because Earth is our priority. At FedEx, we know sustainability means a lot to you. And we feel the same way. Our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2040. We call it Priority Earth. FedEx, where now meets next. Incredible. Um, all right. So your first season when you got there, you're with Reggie uh, Miller, who kicked my ass yeah. for years. Um, <laughs> you're there with uh, Jermaine O'Neal, my rook, my rookie. Did you know this? My rook, nah, Stevie Jackson. Stevie Jackson. Stevie was drafted right out of high school. He didn't go to college, remember? Uh, <laughs> funny story. Uh, Ainge, Danny Ainge drafted him. They And Brian Colangelo, they drafted him with the Suns. Well, we were stacked. I was playing and Steve Nash was playing. Jason Kidd, Kevin Johnson. There was no, he, he wasn't making the team. But he came into camp and I had never seen anything like it. He had, when you and I were playing, you just took what the defense gave you. And now guys have prepackaged moves that they got. Yeah. Right? And Stevie was one of the first people I ever saw, you know, have that kind of stuff. You know, like people talk about the and one game, you know, uh, just the handles, the crazy handles. And I remember one day in practice, Stevie went to cross me up. He threw it real hard. It bounced off his left shin and back into his right hand. And I, <laughs> I fell down, fell down. And he was just standing there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what in the hell so he was that? he knew he was doing it. He, he knew he was. He did it on purpose. He bounced it, hit the floor, hit his left shin, bounced back up into his right hand, and I fell down. And everybody started laughing. Of course they did. And then we had to have him show us how to do it. And, of course, none of us could do it. We, we looked idiotic. But then Stevie got cut, and, uh, but he was my rook there for about a month, and that's where I got to know him. Then he went and made his way back, got his chance with Byron Scott. I was so happy, but I'm going to get into some of that yeah, with you. Yeah. So let me ask you, uh, you had three different jersey numbers in Indiana, 15, 23, and 91. Why? What were those about? Well, 15 was my number. That's like my yep. personal number. It's Vince Carter's number. It's uh, Carmelo Anthony's number. You wore it at St. John's, correct? I wore it at St. John's, wore yep. it in high school. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I became, I always just tried to distract myself from the NBA because I just couldn't sit still. So I said, you know what? I'm going to change my number to all my favorite players. Michael Jordan just came back, and I'm just like, this is insane. <laughs> I'm literally about to play with Michael Jordan or against Michael Jordan. And I played against Michael Jordan previously in the summertime. Uh, in Chicago, then that number, I said, yo, I'm going to be an all-star and a champion in the Michael Jordan number. So I changed my number to 23. This is LeBron James, rookie year. The only year LeBron didn't make the all-star game, <laughs> right? So I'm like, I'm the best defender in the league at this point, and I got Michael Jordan number. My offensive game is coming also, right? And Michael Jordan is an amazing defender. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite part of Michael Jordan. I watch him play defense, so 23 was just to honor him. And then 91, Rodman. That's, Rodman's like my favorite player. Like, 
They should you know what I'm be. I, I, that's so dope. I had no idea about that. And in fact, I'll tell you, you know, we as players, especially when you're playing, you don't want to give it up to anybody. You know, it, when Michael's playing, I played every year against Michael. I came in after him and I left before he left. So he was different. You know his hands. That was a whole different deal. You know how big his hands well, he were. He couldn't but, punk you. I watched the games. He couldn't. Oh, he, he didn't punk me, but he kicked my fucking ass. I know. Though. I you, mean, you know, I, you no, went I, to I, him a couple I, times. Well, I saw you, man. Yeah, but here, here's what I'll say. You know, there are guys, and that's what I want. I want to get into the defensive part with you. There are guys. You know, Michael was so competitive too, and you know, there are times. You know, you get guys on a pump fake, and then you go and you're dunking it right, one dribble, and you're dunking it. I can think of about three times in my career that, you know, I gave him a perfect head and shoulder fake and that against anybody else in the league, Clyde, Glenn Rice, it it didn't, Reggie, it didn't matter. I was one dribble dunking it. And three (laughs) times at least he went, he lunged, he's out of the play, got back to rip it from me somehow when I went to gather. I mean, he was just different, and his competitiveness, he didn't have to, you know. Clyde might have just gone over into the bench and been like, you know, not Michael. He didn't want to be showed up on any play ever. I know. But I know you played the same way, you know, and I was an offensive player for the most part. I tried to hold my own defensively. What is it like? You said I was, by that time, I knew I was the best defensive player in the league. Yeah. What is that confidence? What does that feel like going out there? You know, I, there was pressure on me to, to put the ball in the basket. You know, um, I can't imagine, you know, every defense hinges on you. There's a lot of pressure, but it also has to feel great. It did, man. Like, you know, I could, I could score the ball in high school, college, and NBA is a different level, so I had to figure it out. I wasn't ready to score in the NBA until after a point in time. But when I was averaging 24, that's when I had Steve Jackson. Before Steve Jackson, I did have Al Harrington. Al Harrington was a great yep, defender Al. also, but, but I was always guarding the best players. So most of my energy, you know, I, I was trained not to let somebody score. Because even when I was in high school, I used to hold people to zero, two points. And I did it in the <laughs> NBA too. I held people to two points, zero, three, five. NBA That's players, insane. all-stars. That's <laughs> insane. 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 I was actually like crazy. I'm like, how am I doing this, right? This is crazy, bro. (laughs) I bet you were. I bet you were because people don't understand. I mean, if you don't get your average in the NBA, it's a bad night. And you're holding people to two and none. Crazy. Yeah, it was was just insane. And then, But so I always had that. It wasn't even a pressure. I had the responsibility, but I also wanted to guard. I wanted to guard. So I often would waste so much energy on defense. I wouldn't have no energy for offense. God, see, that's just the opposite of me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why my teams didn't win. But once I got Steve Jackson, average go up 20, 24. When I had um, Shane Battier, 22 in the playoffs. When I had uh, Johnny Salmons, average 20 a night. Because they was always taking the best players so I could take possessions that's great. off. <laughs> that's so great, man. Yeah. Let's take ourselves back to November 19, 2004 in Auburn Hills, Michigan, to the Malice at the Palace. This game was the first time these two teams played since the Eastern Conference Finals, which the Pistons won in six games. The cooks in the kitchen, butting heads, were Ben Wallace and Ron Artest, two of the toughest in the game. With 47 seconds left in the game, all hell broke loose. Wallace to Wallace, right at Artest. This has potential to be serious if they don't get between. All right, we're going to get serious for a second. So when everything seemed to change, you're in Indy, you're playing really well, all-star in 2004, defensive player of the year, you're in the conversation at this point for the MVP, right? I mean, you're playing that well. The team is stacked. Then the big moment at Auburn Hills, walk me through the day, uh, if you can, that day, as much as you can remember, was there anything going on in your life? Uh, yeah, it was. That you could, okay, just walk me through what was going on at that point at the palace. 
But even though something was going on that time, it had nothing to do with that guy throwing something at me. I could have been having the happiest day of my life in Disneyland and somewhere, and I would have been like pissed if I throw something at me. For but, sure. But what happened, so in August, I was thinking about retiring. I was 23. So in August, I started to, because even that summer, I was like stressed. That whole summer, I was just going through a lot. You were thinking about retiring at 23. Yeah. For yeah, what early. reason, Ron? You know, I felt like um, I wanted a year off from having to do too much, just relaxing. And I wanted to focus more on my family because I felt like when I made it, I wasn't focused on my family as much. I'm like, you know, I got to get back to my family. Like, you know, and that was, it was a lot of different things that was happening. And I felt like being away from my family, I'm not working on my family. I could have managed it, but I mean, one could have managed it. I just couldn't manage it. Right. Like I would have preferred to. So, you know, I just saw, I called the NBA in about October, maybe September. And I said, I want to retire. I forget what month. And I remember speaking to a couple of people and they were like, what, what, what? You want to retire? Why? Eventually I said, I need my papers. Like send me the retirement papers. What do I got to do? And this is like right when I signed my contract. Mm -hmm. And then you know, they was going to send my papers. I actually got the papers, you know, to just retire. But it was still on the table for me to stay. And then, uh, you know, I spoke to some of my family members. They said, everything's going to be okay. be all right. I spoke to my family. I said, okay, cool. So I didn't retire. Grandma passed October. So when she passed, I take a trip to Miami. I go down to, um, I just leave the season. I just go party in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, I went down to Source Awards. So my grandma passed, but I, she's just a staple in our lives, you know. And I was like going through a lot, so I kind of let off some steam, came back, and then um, I was practicing every day. And that summer, meanwhile, that summer, Larry Bird was in the gym every day with me. Larry Bird and Chuck Person, that's who I was working with. I go, my average go from 18, the first nine games, I'm averaging 24. Cause I'm, listen, I'm looking at Larry Bird every day. Listen. And I would call Larry, like, how do you do this? I watched your tape yesterday because I was watching Larry. Then I come back to practice, and he's there like, okay, just do it. Just attack, elbow in every day, going full speed. So Larry had a lot to do with how good I was. That's awesome. All right, so if you're at the Palace, that game was physical, really physical. Before we get into that, go back. What was going on, uh, you know, say the night before, that morning, um, as much color as you could give to the day, I guess. Well, I mean, I just had a therapy session the day before, so I was already, I was already in therapy every day. Your own therapist? It was actually just suggested. It came from Chicago when I was when I was in Chicago. Okay. I already started therapy in my rookie year. Good, that's great. And it, I was I was fighting with the therapist a lot. I was always fighting with them because I was always like, you know. But why? I, just, I, <laughs> well, I you know, too. I just felt. Me, I just no, felt like that's I don't what need I would you. say. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, I got this. Also, I was in trouble and quitting my team all the time, so I did need it. Yeah, I did need it. I did. Well, good. All right, so you had therapy the day before, and then what? Yeah. Well, I was good. I was going through stuff. I was practicing. When I fouled Ben Wallace, I was like, the first thing in my head, I'm like, damn it. But it wasn't a hard foul. We've we seen fouls in the 80s. Right. But when you're down 20 points... And Ben Wallace pops just died. When you're down 20 points and then Metal World Peace, Ronald Tess, you know, a guy that's tough like you, you want to show that you, all right, let's do it. <laughs> it's a perfect opportunity to fight. Did you know that his dad had passed? No, I didn't know his dad passed. That, okay. I didn't know. I, I ain't know. Now that you said it, I remember it, but I, I didn't know that at the time. Yeah, I didn't know that until somebody told me because I was always mad at him. Like, because he, I feel like he overreacted. I'm with you, and here's why I'm with you, and I know Ben. I go way back. He Ben played against my dad's college teams. He he played at Virginia Union. Oh wow! It's yeah, like Division two, right? D two, yeah. And so yeah, I saw yeah, Ben. Yeah. I saw Ben play in college. How was he? Was he good? Oh, he he was just like he is now, just beating everything up, or like he was when he played, just chiseled, beating everything up, dunked everything, man. couldn't really shoot it, uh, all of that. He was just a man, you know, somebody wow. messed up and let him go to division two because wow. he's a great wow. dude. But, you know, what stood out to me about that play and that foul was that you fouled him, Ben reacted, and now you're over on your own. And that seemed to be a different Ron Artest in that moment because yeah, yeah. I could see something 
sort of going on in your head that you didn't want to fight with Ben. You know, it, it wasn't I about that. Fight you, you'll fight anybody, but you didn't want to. You were over and removing yourself from the situation, and whether you, you know, you were I'm on the scores table or best. you were trying your best. Okay, so at that point, what do you remember next? Well, you know, I just went, I went to the scores table because my thing was, if Ben wanted to punch me, he would have punched me. He didn't punch me. Cool. Yes. I'm just going to back up, right? Because in, back in the days, in the 80s, you punched somebody in the face. That's why I knew there was something else there because you're not backing away from a fight. Ben is not backing away from a fight. Ben's not going to back away from a fight. He's not going to back away. And, you know, even if you were in the wrong, <laughs> I know you and I know me too. So when you were over there by yourself, I was like, good, he's separating himself from the situation. I was proud. I mean, I jumped on Shaq back my rookie year. Shaq yeah. went after Brad O'Neill, and me and Oakley, we jumped on Shaq back. Like, I'm a rider, but at this time, I was just trying to like, okay, I want to win a title, and I want MVP. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. I'm thinking, so I'm like, don't mess it up. Don't mess and it then, up. So when I got to the scorer's table... You know, I was just chill. Like, I had Steven Jackson and Jermaine O'Neal. Like, Jermaine O'Neal, they're not letting nothing happen to me. Right? Because that's how we are, even though we, was, we had differences. But so I said, I'll be on the scorer's table. I'm literally not worried about nothing. And then I got Anthony Johnson and David Harrison. 